Good evening, everyone. Um, Father John Karchi, the rector here at Mundelein Seminary, and I'd like to welcome everyone as we gather for the resumption of the lecture series that we've had to have online for a couple of years uh, due to the pandemic and other things. But the Pollock Lecture uh, really, I think, is one of the, the wonderful flagship series that we're able to offer here at the University of St. Mary of the Lake. Uh, in 1990, the Chester and Margaret Pollock Chair of Theology was established, uh, and I want to say that Mary Lou Pollock Rafferty, a longtime board member, sadly was not able to be here tonight. There's a family commitment that she has, but she's very much here in spirit, and she certainly sends uh, her support and her regrets that she can't be here. But the first recipient of the Pollock Chair from 1990 to 93 was the eminent scripture scholar, uh, Father Eugene Laverriere. Past recipients have also included uh, Dr. Ewart Cousins, I know known to many of you, Father Ed Oakes, who was on faculty here for a number of years, Father Joe Henshi, uh, sadly recently passed away, but also served here for a number of years, Sister Sarah Butler, uh, another one of our uh, illustrious faculty members, Dr. David Fagerberg, one of the founders of the Liturgical Institute, uh, Dr. Reinhard Huter, and many others. The central focus of the annual lecture, named for Margaret and Chester Pollock, is indeed theology, but the hope, their hope, was always that it might range more broadly than that, and that certainly is my desire, that, uh, you know, in as much as the mission of the university is in service of parish ministry, uh, parish spirituality as it's lived out in the everydayness of life, I think it's a great opportunity for us to bring great scholars here, but who also have great love and great heart for what the church looks like uh, as it's lived out every day. And I can't think of a better representative of that than our speaker tonight. But to introduce her is our new provost. He's been with us now a couple of months, uh, but I'm delighted to welcome you officially to campus in front of everyone here, Dr. Brian Schmiesek. Well, thank you, Father Karchi. Uh, very soon after I started, I became aware of the Pollock Lecture Series and, of course, the Cardinal Meyer Lecture Series. And I had a conversation with Father Karchi about who should we bring in? This is a tremendous opportunity, and it can really set the tone for what we want to accomplish at the University of St. Mary the Lake. And Father Karchi said, I want to do something that will highlight you know, what uh, Hispanic Catholic Chicago is all about. And uh, I said, I think we need to bring in Dr. Deborah Cantor, because she had written a book just a couple years ago, Chicago Catolico. And it tells the story. Uh, I'm, I'm not Mexican American, but I feel like it tells our story as Catholics, as people in Chicago, as people for whom parish life is significant and vibrant and meaningful. And so we had a short Zoom meeting with Dr. Cantor, and we said we need to invite her here. And so tonight, I'm pleased to present to you Dr. Deborah Cantor, who will be sharing with us stories about Chicago Catholic. Um, it's wonderful to be at Mundelein. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I, during the years of the pandemic kind of got lazy about wanting to go to things in person so if you came home from work had dinner put on clothes again you know got out of your sweatpants um thank you for doing that thanks for joining us um it's my third time at mundelein um i got to come here for the very first time maybe 10 years ago with a, a scholar who had done a lot on the 1926 eucharistic congress so that was really quite a tour um, seeing places with him. And then I was back here um, last spring. Um, the Claritian missionaries invited me to their first provincial assembly um, since the pandemic had started. And um, I got to meet some wonderful people in the Sperry Room. Um, I want to give a few thanks before I get into things. So, of course, I want to thank the Pollock family for their, uh, gener their generosity and their thoughtfulness in um, making this lecture possible. Um, thank um, Father Karchi and Provost Brian Schmizak for their invitation, which felt um, very heartfelt 
and um, we had a really interesting conversation about me coming. Um, uh, in terms of making um, things easy with coming today, uh, Mary Bertram in the provost's office and Laurel Panzer in the bookstore was very helpful. Um, a couple people who helped me conceptualize some things about the talk tonight, uh, Johan Garcia, who has taught some at Loyola and works for the United States um, uh, Catholic uh, Bishops Conference. Um, Julio Rangel, who um, writes for Catolico, the Archdiocesan Spanish language paper. Um, <coughs> and um, I would also like to um, do a little special thank you to Father Don Nevins, who has come all the way from Little Village, from uh, Blessed Agnes. Um, when I was at the very, very beginning of doing this research, and I had no idea what I was doing, and this is 22 years ago, um, Father Don was just very gracious in answering questions and like letting me sort of hang around St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> um, so anyways, it's, a, it's the first time I've seen him in 15 years, and so it, it feels like a nice kind of meeting of worlds. Um, and last, I want to recognize organizations that value their history and organizations that preserve their documents and their material culture. Um, and so, uh, you know, and hire professional archivists. So in my case, in writing this book, I was extremely fortunate to have pretty open access at the Archdiocesan Archives downtown. So um, they were incredibly helpful there. Um, and I also did quite a bit of work with the um, Claritian Missionaries um, Archives, and uh, that's become kind of a second home for me in Chicago. Um, so as we get going here, I am going to um, pass <coughs> this around the room. This is called a retablo. We're going to talk about retablos in a few minutes, but I want people to be able to like physically touch it. So this is a retablo thanking St. Jude for saving a, 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 um, for bringing a daughter back to health. So, and it, it'll end up back with me, right? Yeah. So, okay. So, um, so can I have a, I just love to know who's in the room. So um, raise your hand if you speak Spanish on some level. Quien habla español aquí? Okay, halfish. okay, that's good, muy bien. Um, who has been to St. Francis of Assisi Parish? on Roosevelt Road. A little, little less, okay. Well, I, I guess I could do this. Who's been to the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Des Plaines? <laughs> okay, it's like the new St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I got started on this research. So once upon a time, when I went to graduate school at the University of Virginia, I studied colonial Mexico. And I worked on the 18th and 19th century, and I worked with manuscript sources in everything in Todo en Español. And um, this was my first book that came out of that, uh, Hijos del Pueblo, a kind of an ethno history, trying to recover the stories of um, rural, mostly indigenous women and men in Mexico. Um, and um, during the years that I was working on Hijos del Pueblo, I am actually a, a native of Chicagoland. I grew up in Oak Park, and I would come back and visit Chicago. And um, every time I came back in the 80s and the early 90s, it seemed like more and more of Chicago was becoming Mexican. And I was just like very fascinated by this. And I was recognizing all these regional things. And um, one of the days where this uh, really came home to me, <laughs> this would be about in the year 2000, I was uh, in Little Village on a Sunday, walking down 26th Street, and we turned down a side street, and we went to St. Agnes of Bohemia Church. And mass was just ending, and there were kids running around, and everybody was speaking in Spanish, and there were rosas in front of the Virgin of Guadalupe. I was like, my gosh, this is such a Mexican church. And then I looked up at the windows, and every window in the sanctuary had the names in check of um, the donating peoples or donating organizations. 
I just kind of had this like aha moment. Like this was not always the most Mexican church. It belonged to another ethnic group. And then as a Chicagoan and a historian, I realized this must be the story of like dozens of parishes and dozens of neighborhoods. You know, they used to be Polish, they used to be Italian, and now they're Mexican. And I went to the archive for two weeks to see if there would be anything. Like, could I tell any story about this? So I went for two weeks to the archive and then I spent the next 20 years in and out of that. Um, and so I was in the archives looking at old papers and memos and photographs, but I also started getting out with um, parishioners and parishes. Um, I did oral histories with a lot of people um, pastors of different ethnicities and um, parishioners. So the lovely women uh, under the Chicago sign, those are the St. Francis Cobras. These are Mexican-American women who grew up on the near west side of Chicago. And the Cobras was the name of their volleyball and softball team. And they would still get together into their 80s for reunions. And like they started inviting me. I like drive in from Michigan for Cobra's reunions. <laughs> so um, anyway, so it was such a strong tie that had come out of friendship sports teams out of their parish, St. Francis of Assisi. Um, another wonderful event I went to um, in the hallway here where we have the sisters. Um, this was an all year school reunion at Providence of God which was originally um, a Lithuanian church <coughs> and became a mostly Mexican church. And um, for the all year school of reunion, their teaching sisters, the Sisters of St. Casimir attended. And it was just a really wonderful experience. So in doing this kind of participant observer research, um, I learned that a parish is not just a church. A parish is not just mass on Sunday. It's not just sacraments. Um, I learned that it was like a living, breathing, and in many cases, especially historically, it was really kind of a 24-7 kind of place. Um, a little bit more of my participant observer activities, helping out at the Kermes at uh, St. Procopius on 18th Street, an old Czech parish. Oh, and now I've gone <coughs> too far. Okay, so I'm going to give you, read you a very brief overview of what the book does, but mostly I'm going to talk and share my photos. So Chicago Catolico tells the story of how Mexicans have made a home in Chicago and its churches. Today, Mexicans and other Latinos are transforming the archdiocese into Chicago Catolico in ways that past generations of German and Irish bishops, priests, and sisters could not imagine. I use the Catholic parish to view Mexican immigration and transformation in the United States. For individuals arriving from Mexico, these parishes served as a refugio or a refuge. Mexicans fiercely attached themselves to specific parishes, much like European ethnic groups in days gone by. The parish was a place to speak Spanish. It was a place to get job leads. It was a place to reminisce about Mexico. At the same time, these parishes had an Americanizing influence on Mexican members. Men and women took part in regular devotions and parish activities in ways quite similar to Polish, Italian, or Irish Catholics throughout the city. Their children participated in May crownings of the Virgin Mary, and they played baseball on parish sports teams. Many Mexican-American laypeople gained a sense of Mexicanidad, of being Mexican by participating in its religious and social events. One of the things I really argue in this book is that these parishes acted as a glue that connected immigrant parents and their U.S. reared children. So here we come to um, the retablo. So we're going to step back a hundred years and thinking about what it would be like to be one of the first Mexicanos arriving in the city. Um, many of them came um, on the trains. Uh, many of them came as track workers, and of course all the trains go through Chicago. <coughs> so we have a retablo here, um, and it comes from uh, 1918, and it's the 18th of November, 
and we see all that traffic. And then we have this man, Matias Lara, who is on his knees holding a really big candle, right? So this is what he um, wrote at the bottom of his retablo. Finding my, I'm translating, finding myself lost in Chicago, I entrusted myself to the Virgin of San Juan de los Lagos, asking that she illuminate the road that I sought. I give her thanks for having granted me what I asked, and I dedicate the present offering as a commemoration. So Matias Lara, he can't find where he's supposed to go. He can't find anybody who speaks Spanish. The city's just like chock full of people. He was probably, you know, on the edge of the loop where the train stations were. He's so overwhelmed. What does he do? There's no Google, so he can't like do that on his phone. Uh, you know, <coughs> he's like praise to the Virgin Mary, right? And she's going to help me find my road. Um, and the thing that's interesting about this is that when Matias came to Chicago in 1918 was when basically the very first individuals are showing up. Um, he had his faith in him, right? Um, but there were no churches that served Spanish-speaking people at that time. So um, he was not going to be able to connect with priests. Um, and he certainly was not going to find an image of the Virgin of San Juan de los Lagos. So um, the process of building a Mexican identity and community well beyond the Southwest began at two Chicago parishes in the 1920s. And these two parishes um, were the last two national parishes that Cardinal Mundelein approved. He didn't want any more Polish parishes, Italian parishes, Croatian. He believed that the Catholic Church should help Americanize people. So enough with that. But then the Mexicans started showing up and people like Mother Cabrini started advocating for them. Um, and um, the Spanish-speaking Claritian Order um, was working in Texas. They had come to the United States in 1902 and with their parishes in San Antonio, they heard that there were thousands of Mexicanos up in Chicago and they were like, hmm, let's, we're missionary priests, let's go and serve them. Um, and eventually they got Cardinal Mundelion's approval. Um, so they came up to Chicago um, in uh, like 1925, 26. Um, and the first mass in Spanish was at the church Our Lady of Guadalupe, basically under the Skyway in South Chicago. Um, and about a year later, um, the first mass for Spanish-speaking people was held at St. Francis of Assisi, which was an old German parish. And you can still find, there's little bits and pieces in um, like the choir loft where we have like signage and labels in German, even though they ripped down much of the rest of the interior, but there's still a little bit in there. <laughs> um, St. Francis of Assisi, it is known to people throughout Chicago and I would say the Midwest and I even saw reports of like people in Mexico knowing if you came to Chicago and you got yourself to St. Francis you would sort of find the right place you would find that refugio. Um, so from the 1920s through the 1960s St. Francis the church the rectory the school the convent and crucially the gym provided a lively nurturing home for Mexican immigrants and Mexican American young people. The young people may have grown up in poverty, but with a parish to call their own, they did not feel marginalized. This Catedral Mexicana, St. Francis, anchored the community and its children grew up with a positive grounding in Mexican and US Catholic traditions. Their affirmative experience at St. Francis would manifest itself as thousands of Mexican origin people entered new neighborhoods in the 1960s. And as they entered new neighborhoods and new parishes dominated by Euro-Americans, many former St. Francis members would assume important vanguard positions. Um, I think uh, more than half of you have not visited St. Francis. It is a real treasure in the city. Um, this is what it looked like in like 1948. It looks beautiful but different today. Um, it has a remarkable and new set of windows that are about 20 years old that really speak to a very Latin American Catholicism. All of the saints and blesseds on the windows, they're all people from Latin America. And uh, it's, it's really pretty remarkable. 
Um, so St. Francis is uh, basically surrounded by University Village and like playing fields and gyms of the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, the university was, um, you know, planned and they needed to start knocking down buildings uh, around 1960 and the Mexican part of the near west side was very badly hit. That was the largest Mexican neighborhood in Chicago. So like Roosevelt and Halstead, about 40,000 Mexican and Mexican American people living there. Um, one of the neighborhoods that people moved to when their homes were demolished um, was uh, Pilsen which is, you know, as the crow flies, it's not very far away. You have to walk under the railroad viaducts. But before 1960, they were, it was a very different world because um, when Mexican people um, went to Pilsen, um, it was dominated by uh, European American groups. So this is a map that I made in my book and um, We've got this sort of strip going along 18th Street. 13 parishes in this neighborhood. <laughs> and it's a little game I play when I'm in Pilsen. Like, how many church steeples can I see from where I'm standing? Can I see three? Can I see four? I've never seen five from one place, but four you can see. So we'll take you on a little tour of the neighborhood. So we're in the east, right by the Dan Ryan. Um, Providence of God Lithuanian Church. St. Procopius was built by Czech immigrants. Um, St. Adelbert's, which continues to be in the news, um, is kind of a Polish basilica. Um, uh, St. Vitus was another Czech church. St. Anne's <coughs> was another Polish church. St. Paul's German, and then there's a few others that I'm not mentioning, Slovaks, Croatians. So the neighborhood, very densely populated, a lot of different languages, a lot of different national traditions. Um, and Mexicanos come in small numbers um, uh, before 1950, um, and they move into parishes like this. So um, parishes where you, know, you walk in the door and like the language you would hear would be Croatian or the language you would hear would be Czech. And you know, like the publications that they're putting out, um, these, this anniversary album, um, you know, it's, a lot of it is in Czech, and that's in 1950. Um, so I wonder, what was this experience like? What was it like to be the first Mexicanos who were walking into these not only kind of white parishes, but like very national? And um, I always wondered, like, who was the first one? <laughs> who was the first one? And I actually went through, like, stacks of parish bulletins from um, St. Pius, which is uh, the territorial parish on Ashland. And um, this is from 1947, a parish bulletin. And um, in the mass intentions on the Friday, there was a 7 o'clock mass in 1947 to thank San Juan de los Lagos a reference to the Virgin of San Juan de los Lagos. She's like the second <laughs> most popular Virgin Mary in Mexico, Guadalupe, and then the Virgin of San Juan. So somebody felt comfortable enough to go into that office and make that mass intention. Um, male, female, I don't know. Um, and somebody, you know, was probably, St. Pius was sort of becoming their church. Otherwise, they would have gone to St. Francis. Um, so, uh, in the 1950s, the movement from the near west side, from St. Francis, um, really picked up to Pilsen. People came um, not just from the near west side, they also came directly from Mexico, they came from Texas, and um, people found that it was pretty easy to move into Pilsen. So, like this, you know, very white neighborhood, the landlords would rent to them and realtors would sell them houses. And I was kind of curious about that. And I found a report from Catholic Charities from the middle of this that I think really kind of gets to the heart of the issue. So Catholic Charities trying to explain what was going on in Pilsen in the middle of the 1950s. Mexicans are still viewed as invaders by the older residents, many of whom still retain their own ethnic outlook and language, Croatian, Slovak, etc. However, the Mexican is considered a much lesser evil than the surrounding Negroes. 
I'll just say this feels kind of like the Chicago that I grew up in. I was born in 1961. And like the big issue that seemed to be on everybody's mind in Chicago was kind of this black white issue and neighborhoods and suburbs um, that were white dominant were very concerned about <coughs> going black. And there were all these issues about neighborhoods turning. So this was what was going on in Pilsen. Um, people preferred Mexicans to black people. Um, and the priests realized if Mexicans move into the neighborhood, they could enroll their kids in the schools and they could become parishioners. So, you know, like they're Catholic, so that, that like they're the right flavor. Um, so there's like a grudging acceptance by many priests in the 1950s and some of the real pioneers of integration um, of this process of making parishes Mexican were the kids. So often the enrollment of Mexican, Mexican American <coughs> children um, started five to 10 years before the parents started attending mass um, at the parish. So here we are, it's 1957, uh, Sister Helene's class at Providence of God. This was the Lithuanian church. And on the back, uh, on the wall by the windows, um, we've got, um, I think the title of the Lithuanian national anthem, I'm a little, you know, Lithuania, our dear homeland. There were Mexican American kids who grew up at Providence of God who swear that they learned the catechism in Lithuanian. So, quien sabe, I don't know, it's a good story. So um, most of these kids were Lithuanian American, some of them might have been Cold War refugees, but like look at the little boy who's smiling up at the camera next to the sign. So here's one of our first Mexican pioneros who's sort of, you know, going there He's going there six days a week, right? Because he has to go to mass on Sunday with his class. So, um, and maybe his parents start going with him as well. Um, by 1965, three Pilsen churches were celebrating Misa and Espanol. And for those of you who know some Catholic history, that's an interesting time period because before 1965, the, the mass is in Latin, right? So it was a question of would the homily be delivered in Spanish, English, Lithuanian, right? Would the hymns be sung in Spanish or in English or in Polish? Um, so the, the movement to do the mass in the vernacular opens some doors, plus the demography is changing so fast at these parishes. So we'll take a little look at one of them, um, St. Anne's. So St. Anne's um, is in the kind of western edge of Pilsen, a uh, Polish parish, um, very nationalist. Um, and um, let me tell you about the installation of the Virgin of Guadalupe, which happened in 1969 and marked a real turning point. <laughs> a Mexican family at the parish donated the image. It came from Mexico with papers and all, they recalled to me. Lupe and Matias Almendares were selected to carry the image and they joined the couple that donated it um, through the nearby streets. The two couples proudly carried the Virgin of Guadalupe on a two block procession led by a priest before entering St. Anne's Sanctuary. For decades, the image remained prominently displayed by the main altar parallel to Our Lady of Chestakova. Taking part in the procession and installation, recalled the Almendares, felt beautiful. Soon after, Mexican parishioners purchased us a Mexican flag to place by the Virgin's side. The installation of the Virgin Mary, of the Mexican Virgin, marked a change to Mexicans and Poles alike. And as uh, their daughter recalled with this installation of this image, the Polish people realized you weren't going anywhere. Um, so I want to tell you the story of, this is a good room, <laughs> this is like a good room to show this image. So, you know, I've given this talk in like Buffalo, New York, and I've done it at Catholic University, and especially if you're with college kids, a lot of people don't know who that is. <laughs> so, um, the, the first Mayor Daly. Um, the real one, as far as I'm concerned. I want to tell you the story of um, the adult woman who's here. 
Um, her name was Julia Rodriguez. And Julia um, was born um, on the border in Texas. She was from far Texas. And um, so I went to interview her. She moved to Chicago when she got married in the mid 1950s. And I went to interview her maybe in 2004. So she'd been in <laughs> Chicago for 54 years. She had raised four kids here. And I start to you know, get my tape recorder out and this and that. And she says, ¿Se puede hacer la entrevista en español? And I'm kind of like thinking, I was like, claro, of course we can. But I'm kind of thinking, wow, she's been in Chicago for 54 years and she's from Texas, like, what does that mean? Then I thought about my own grandmother who, trust me, you know, she's, she didn't read an English language paper like when she was in her 70s. So she had come to Chicago when she was 16. So, okay, whatever. So anyway, so I did this interview with, with Julia and she's telling me about her childhood. Her family were, um, they were migrant workers. They picked cotton, pisca de algodón. She told stories about like going to Mississippi to pick cotton and that she often wouldn't finish school years, right? Because they had to move around so much. So she was like a little self-conscious. I don't know, maybe she had finished second grade, maybe third. And anyway, so we do the interview and she tells me all about St. Procopius, her parish. And um, at the end of the interview, she's elderly, mobility problems. She asked me to go to her bedroom that she's got something for me. She feels kind of awkward going into this lady's bedroom. So she has this glossy photograph that I'm sharing with you tonight. She had left it out on her bed because she thought maybe she would share it with me. So, um, and what we've got, this is uh, December 12th. Um, uh, I think it's 1976. Um, and Julia and her husband Ruben had been chosen by St. Procopius Parish um, to bring this image of the Virgin of Guadalupe to the mayor of Chicago. When I asked her about going to St. Procopius when she first got to Chicago, she said, Los Polacos como que no. With the Poles, no way. So this term Polacos in Chicago is, um, it doesn't necessarily mean Poles, it means like Slavic people. So kind of like the way Chinos means anybody who's Asian. So that kind of thing. But los Polacos como que no. It was so awkward with the Slavic people. Okay, so 1976, um, Julia and her husband are picked to, to go to City Hall. And the photo that she wanted to share with me expresses an adulthood of stability, respectability, faith, and belonging. Julia stood proudly as a Mexican-American Catholic with the pinnacle of the, her adopted city, the mayor himself a Catholic. With her husband, Ruben, and the parish children, she represented St. Procopius. Two decades earlier, she hesitated to attend mass there. Los polacos como que no. In 1976, St. Procopius was home. Chicago had usually been willing to give a chance to Mexicans, fellow Catholics, who like the Irish, Czechs, Poles, and Lithuanians also expressed their devotion to the Virgin Mary. Pilsen became Chicago's <laughs> first Mexican majority neighborhood precisely in the 1970s, and the Mexican Catholic voices grew louder. Just months after Julia visited the mayor's office on Good Friday, 1977, the first Via Crucis, the Living Way of the Cross, took over 18th Street. Um, these events, going to the mayor's office and um, doing the Via Crucis, had very different tones and messages, but both showed the rise of a Chicago Catolico. For that Via Crucis, seven parishes banded together, planning, rehearsing for months, making costumes, growing beards, renting a horse to make a Good Friday that no one would forget. The Via Crucis proclaimed Pilsen as Mexican and Catholic space in a neighborhood dominated just 15 years earlier by Poles, Czechs, and Lithuanians. Um, and I think that these events, the, the first Via Crucis, which goes on till today, um, even during the sort of lockdown year, the first 2020, there was not supposed to be a Via Crucis, but people kind of did one anyhow, it was sort of small. <laughs> but, um, but like people, like how could you not do one? So anyways. Um, 
So these 1970s events, I think, were unimaginable in 1918 when Matias Lara and the first Mexicans arrived in Chicago. In the 1920s, no one would have imagined that Chicago would become the second largest Mexican metropolis in the United States. Although I think we might be sinking to the third. I think I have a feeling Houston might be beating us, but whatever. Um, also, nobody in the 20s ever could have imagined how transnational the Mexican population in Chicago would be with so much back and forth. And even for the people who can't travel, the people who are undocumented and basically stuck in Chicago, they really managed to stay in touch with home in a lot of really interesting ways. Um, the other thing nobody would have imagined and Cardinal Mundelein never would have imagined is that the city would be dotted in parishes that serve Spanish speaking people. He approved those two Spanish-speaking parishes in the 20s. That was it. He never approved any, you know what, the Puerto Ricans came in the 50s, they never got a national parish. So, like the policies had changed. Um, so here's a little slide from Parish Finder. These are just places that um, celebrate mass in Spanish in the city of Chicago. So obviously the archdiocese is much larger. So once upon a time, it was just two churches where you could um, celebrate with Spanish speakers. Today, Misa en Español is celebrated at 86 parishes throughout the archdiocese. That's 38%. Um, and that does not include the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe because it's not a parish, but they do hold six Spanish masses. Thanks, Julio Rangel from Católico. The making of Mexican parishes helped generations of immigrants create new homes and identities. First at St. Francis and Our Lady of Guadalupe in South Chicago, and in the past half century at parishes across Pilsen. So I wrote a book about making parishes Mexican, but in those same years, we have seen a serious unmaking of parishes in the city. So Pilsen uh, in, um, 1915, I had 13 parishes. And when I began my research in 2000, there were seven parishes. And today, there are three parishes that are open. Um, a little uh, <coughs> reminder here, um, there are still people who are organizing and holding vigils outside of St. Adelbert's, a combination of Polish American and um, Mexican people who are deeply attached to St. Adelbert's. Um, these recent parish closings are inseparable from battles over Mexican identity, gentrification, and feelings of abandonment by the archdiocese. Many Mexican people view the string of parish closings as a symptom of gentrification or the whitening of their Barrio Pilsen with its distinctly Mexican Catholic caste. For many Pilsen residents, the notions of home, ethnicity, neighborhood, and faith are intertwined very much as it was for Italians and Irish people a century earlier. And in an odd twist of demographic fate, it has fallen to Mexican people to fight to preserve the neighborhood and its structures, including the churches built by Lithuanians, Czechs, and Poles. We're gonna shift gears a little bit. So I, I th before I get to my conclusion, I thought I would share this from um, Pope Francis. I've never read Pope Francis aloud. Um, when he writes these things, what, does he write them in Latin or Italian? I have no idea. Does he write them in Latin? Anybody know? Okay, we're good. So, the English translation from Fratelli Tutti, 2020. Let us admit that for all the progress we have made, we are still illiterate when it comes to accompanying, caring for, and supporting the most frail and vulnerable members of our developed societies. We have become accustomed to looking the other way, passing by, ignoring situations until they affect us directly. So I'm gonna close with uh, some brief reflections about the three years since my book was published. So I actually, it came out in February, 2020. <laughs> you can't believe how many book talks I had planned for that. I had thousands of those bookmarks to give away. I still have them. So things kind of shut down for a long time. Um, 
So in the three years since the book was published, these have been very trying times. The pandemic, an unstoppable <coughs> migration crisis. I mean, like three years ago, if they told you there were gonna be busloads of people sent from Texas to Chicago, like, okay. Um, the xenophobia of the Trump administration and its aftermath and the unresolved hope for a comprehensive immigration reform. Um, the last five years that I taught at Albion College in Michigan, a lot of my students were Latino. A lot of them were from LA and they were from Chicago. And if they were not immigrants themselves, they were part of you know, mixed status families. So questions about documentation and legalization were really big for these young folks. And what I picked up from them was that no matter what generation in the United States, for many Latino people, it can feel like America neither cares about them nor wants them beyond their role as workers. Many Latinos feel that no matter what they do or how much they achieve, they remain inscrutable, unknowable to the American mainstream. Further, it sometimes feels that the US Catholic Church neither cares about them nor recognizes their particular trials. Not all pastors appreciate their unique flavors of devotion. Not all pastors understand the ways Catholicos want to connect with the church. Latino Catholic friends and colleagues have shared with me the hurt of pastors refusing to celebrate El Doce de Diciembre to honor the Virgin of Guadalupe. And this in parishes with significantly growing um, Mexican populations. Um, another friend shared with me the story of her pastor on the southwest side, heading towards Midway, quipping to Mexican-American parishioners after Mass, I know two Spanish words, Alleluia and Amen, and I don't need to know any more. Um, a friend, Lisa, a college-educated, second-generation Chicagoan, feels the sting from her young pastor and her nearby parish simply does not feel like home. With exasperation, she told me, everyone likes our food, but they should know about our culture. I'm gonna end with the dedication from my book, hopefully a little more hopeful. Um, so I dedicated my book to the very generous people, del pasado, del presente, of St. Francis of Assisi, St. Adelbert, St. Anne, St. Paul, St. Pius, St. Procopius, and Providence of God, and to the generation of Chicagoans to come from Mexico and around the world. And um, that mural, by the way, is at St. Pius, and that is another undersung um, treasure of Catholic and Mexican-American life in Chicago. Um, I am a recently retired college professor, so I'm giving you a little suggested reading. So um, this, especially for people who work directly in ministry, um, I highly recommend <coughs> Susan Reynolds' brand new book, which is about a, um, a multinational Latinx parish in Boston called People Get Ready. And it is such an amazing read, and it's got a lot of really creative suggestions for the kind of work that people can do in a poor urban parish. And again, because I have the podium, I can suggest that you read anything. So um, <laughs> um, I really love this book of short stories by Ruben de Goyado. Uh, he's a Tejano author. And this book, boy, does this capture popular devotion and live religion. It's both very Tejano, but it would be recognizable for people who um, live and work in Chicago. So. There's your homework for, you know, the next time I come back. Um, and Ruben's book was just long listed for a Penn Faulkner Award, which is pretty exciting. Um, so that's what I have for you tonight. Um, the bookstore is selling my book, which is pretty wonderful. And um, also I want to acknowledge my book was published by the University of Illinois Press. Uh, I didn't think they were necessarily going to take a Catholic book. <laughs> and look, they made me this like beautiful cover. So, and they've been pretty supportive as I've been trying to get the book out.